In biochemistry, a signalling cascade is a series of chemical reactions that occur within a cell when initiated by a stimulus. It's basically a way of describing a series of stages in which each stage derives from what preceded it. Think of it like a small rock kicked at the top of a mountain. The momentum of this rock will move larger rocks, which in turn, with the assistance of gravity, will dislodge even larger ones. All it took was a single stimulus in the form of a kicked rock, which led to a full-blown rock slide. Signaling cascades is all about learning each step in this process. If we know how the whole system works, then we should, in theory, know the full effects of anything that interferes with the cascade. Today, we will be covering the coagulation cascade. Now, I appreciate the fact that this can seem quite complicated on the surface. When I showed this diagram to my girlfriend, I'm pretty sure it gave her an aneurysm. So let's break this down, shall we? Before we get started, it is important to know that hemostasis, which literally means to stop bleeding, is broken down into two stages. First, we have primary hemostasis, in which an unstable platelet plug forms at the site of injury. Then, the coagulation cascade is activated to stabilize the plug, stopping blood flow and allowing increased time to make necessary repairs. This process minimizes blood loss after injuries. The coagulation cascade consists of three pathways, the intrinsic, extrinsic, and common pathways that interact together to form a stable blood clot. The cascade involves the activation of a series of clotting factors, proteins involved in blood clotting. Each clotting factor is a serine protease and are initially in an inactive form called a zymogen. In the presence of glycoprotein cofactors, the clotting factor is activated and then able to catalyze the next reaction. The intrinsic pathway requires a stimulus in the form of collagen, calocrine, and high molecular weight kininogen, or HMWK. This encounters what's known as the Hagman factor. Factor 12 is converted into its active form, here denoted by the small a. This in turn leads to activation of factor 11. Activated factor 11, alongside a calcium ion, activates factor 9. The enzyme thrombin activates factor 8. Activated factors 8 and 9, alongside an additional calcium ion, activates factor 10 in the common pathway. It can seem a tad counterintuitive, as the numbers seem to be all over the place, so be careful not to think of them as running in a sequential order. The extrinsic pathway begins when damage to the tissue occurs, and as we can see, is much simpler than the other pathways. This tissue damage exposes tissue factor, also known as factor 3, to blood, activating it. Activated factors 3 and 7, alongside a calcium ion, are required to activate factor X, much like how it works in the intrinsic pathway. As we move down to the common pathway, we can see that factor 10 is activated independently by both the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways and can occur after activation of either one. This is an incredibly important fact later down the line. As we will see, if we want medication to be effective, it would either have to simultaneously affect both the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways or affect the common pathway to stop the cascade downstream. Activated factors 10, 5, and a calcium ion bind together, forming a prothrombinase complex. The prothrombinase complex then activates factor 2 into its active form. Activated factor 2 is also known as thrombin and used to cleave several reactions, including factor 8, back in the intrinsic pathway. First, it cleaves fibrinogen, turning factor 1 into its active form. Afterwards, thrombin cleaves the stabilizing factor, factor 13, into its active form. Factor 13 binds with calcium to then create fibrin crosslinks to help stabilize the clot. Now that we have an overview of the cascade, 
we can see when and how clotting diseases can interfere with this process. Clotting diseases typically either increase or decrease production in one of these clotting factors. Perhaps the most well-known is haemophilia, an inherited bleeding disorder in which the blood does not clot properly. This can lead to spontaneous bleeding as well as bleeding following injuries. There are three types of haemophilia, A through C, which all affect the intrinsic pathway. Haemophilia A through C affects clotting factors 8, 9 and 11 respectively. Von Willebrand disease is the most common bleeding disorder and is characterized by a deficiency in Von Willebrand factor due to an autosomal dominant genetic mutation. The Von Willebrand factor is mostly involved in primary hemostasis where it helps platelets stick together. The factor also plays a role in secondary hemostasis by helping stabilize factor 8 in the intrinsic pathway. Factor 8 and Von Willebrand factor are two distinct but related glycoproteins that circulate in plasma as a tightly bound complex. A vitamin K deficiency may occur when a sufficient amount of vitamin K is not absorbed from foods or when not enough food with vitamin K is consumed. Vitamin K is a cofactor required to make factors 2, 7, 9 and 10 functional. Therefore, vitamin K deficiency affects all three pathways. Vitamin K is synthesized in the liver and tends to be prevalent in individuals with mild to moderate chronic cholestatic liver disease. Now, all of these diseases have an anticoagulant effect, but there may actually be times when this anticoagulant effect is desired. Patients at risk of a blood clot, for instance, will often be given blood thinning medication. Now, just as a side note, although they are often referred to as such, blood thinning medication doesn't actually thin your blood. It is an anticoagulant and functions via inhibition of the coagulation cascade. As you might expect, common side effects of anticoagulants are an increased risk of bleeding and bruising. Now, it's actually quite important that such medications are never stopped prematurely or suddenly. The body will often try to compensate and sudden cessation can actually lead to a stroke. Perhaps the most commonly seen medication here is warfarin. Warfarin blocks the liver's use of vitamin K to produce clotting factors. In a sense, it almost replicates vitamin K deficiency. If a patient is suffering from an illness such as a coronary heart disease, however, then this is desirable to us. As warfarin has a similar effect to vitamin K deficiency, it blocks factors in the intrinsic, extrinsic, and common pathways simultaneously. Rivaroxaban, apixaban, and edoxaban are a trio of medications which all bind to activated factor 10. It effectively blocks the amplification of the coagulation cascade, preventing the formation of thrombus. These drugs tend to be advantageous to warfarin as they do not interact with the liver directly and as such do not require frequent blood tests, nor are they as susceptible in their mode of action due to changes in the liver on vitamin K production. For people suffering from haemophilia and von Willebrand disease, a common medication used is desmopressin acetate. Desmopressin exerts its hemostatic effect by inducing synthesis of the von Willebrand factor by endothelial cells. This has an effect on both primary and secondary hemostasis. For those suffering from a vitamin K deficiency, it's important to discover whether this is due to a poor diet or due to liver dysregulation. If it is the former, then a dietitian and a change in eating habits can effectively treat it. If it's the latter, then the drug phytonodione is often used. Phytonodione acts as a cofactor to an enzyme found in the liver called gamma glutamyl carboxylase, which converts the inactive forms of coagulation factors 2, 7, 9 and 10 into their active forms, directly countering the vitamin K deficiency. That's all from me. Thank you very much for watching.